Um, while I introduce myself, I'm going to try a poll everywhere for the first time. Um, you're my guinea pigs. So you'll see on the screen there are two ways that you can join Poll Everywhere and share just a brief statement about what you would like to know about this topic. And while you do that, do, um, has everybody got the, the information that they need from that? I hope. I don't know where all your pictures went. You all disappeared. So um, you're going to text my name all together to 22333 or go to pollev.com and enter my name all smushed together, Joan Medlin. Um, so while you're doing that, they'll show those answers in a minute, but while you're doing that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I am Joan. I am a registered dietitian and have been for forever, it feels like. Um, but the best work that I ever have done has been because of this young man who's flying across your screen. This is Andy, and I will share his labels with you just so that you have an idea of my um, perspective on some things. He clearly has Down syndrome. He also has autism spectrum disorder, experiences a seizure disorder and has celiac disease, and is a man of few words. That is my husband. Um, and this is my other son, Ryan, who lives up in Washington State now, and they got married in Texas. Um, but these two boys um, taught me more than I could ever learn in my degree and in my internship. Um, you might at times hear Andy in the background, even though all my doors are closed, so I just wanted to warn you of that. Um, and believe it or not, my picky eater is the taller one. So he, you know, I was really thankful to meet Cheryl because then I learned about how to handle the taller one a little bit better um, in a family way. So here, let's take a, a look. Oops, show responses. You guys haven't been responding. You're no fun. So I don't know what you want to learn. Or have you responded? And um, I'm having a little bit of problems. I joined Joan Paired. Dice those sessions. So I, um, I, I have to, I'm leaving hers and coming back yours. I think I have to make sure everything is in caps on yours. So there it is. It looks like that. And we can even come back to it. Um, if you all manage to get that part of why I asked that question, what you, would you like to know about this topic is so that um, I can uh, come back to it and see what I didn't hit. Um, see if I'm going to hit it um, and respond to that appropriately. But what we know is that um, lots of us don't have a lot of experience with um, with developmental disabilities from our our uh, internships and our schooling, and and that can be a little bit rough. Um, so that's something to think about um, as I put this together. So I'm just going to go ahead and. Let's see if there are any responses. There are some. How, oh, and they're very big. Um, okay, we'll make this bigger. How to support families without adding to the burden. Um, interested in an update. Sensory input, sensory and textures. Um, tips for kids with sensory aversion to foods. Did you like how big they are, some of them? Um, sensitivity to textures. So textures is coming up as a theme. Um, so, okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for helping get that going so that it works. Um, so let's um, move on a little bit and I'm gonna get my PowerPoint back up. The Zoom world, right? I can do that. All right, there we go. Um, so we had some learning objectives and, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on those, but it's basically about applying the trust model um, to all the kinds of things that we run into in a, in a generic group we're calling kids with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Know that my focus tends to be on those who have disabilities that are similar to Down syndrome um, and definitely an expertise in Down syndrome. Um, so as Cheryl and I were talking, um, we were talking about the fact that one of the buzzwords and things that we talk about a lot are, is equity and equality. And you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the different posters that are out there for equity and equality. And the difference being, you know, that we need to change our supports depending on what a person needs to be successful. Um, so the division of responsibility is kind of in the same 
vein. Um, I want to see if I can bring up, I don't know where it all goes. There it is. Oh, it, go, it comes and then it goes. I'm trying to find the thing that will show me if you raise your hands. Well, I'm not going to see it. Um, so I'm not going to ask you if you have a familiar, why don't you tell me out loud, just unmute yourself really quickly and I'm going to get over Zoom really soon. Um, are you familiar with the division of responsibility in feeding or the feeding relationship? You can call them either things. How familiar are you with it? Somebody share. We're getting yeses coming in from Valerie and Kim. Very familiar. Spalding said, yep. Greg referred to it all, to, all the time. Perfect. Okay, now I finally got the chat to stay up, so Very I won't good. try to hold hands. I've got the chat. Boy. When they disappear and you can't get them back, that's the hardest part. So true. Okay, so, so you know the feeding relationship, and, and so here it is. The, the parents are responsible for what, where, when, and how food's presented, and the children are responsible for how much and whether or not it's eaten. So I learned that from Ellen Satter for the first time, sitting in the back row of a presentation, I think, for ODA um, when I was very young, and Andy was very young. Um, and as she did it, she sort of said, but it doesn't include children with disabilities and disabilities are in one big bunch. And um, I was a young mother at that time um, to Andy. And, and if anyone knows anything about me, one of the things you don't do is you say something blanket like that around me because I'll say, well, why not? So disability sort of puts this cloud over the feeding relationship and and people start to wonder well you know is it the same is, is it different i mean they have all these things we have to think about all these things but that's not necessarily true but what are some of those things that people start to be distracted by the definition of health and safety is it different how do they make choices well then there's those rights we have to think about everybody's rights and and their individualism um, and how do we role model for this person um, and it, do, I don't have enough training. I don't have the training that I need to support this person or this family. And then, and then this thing comes in and we call it person-centered thinking. And if you live in the disability world, person-centered thinking is, is like the, the central way of thinking. It's what we really want people to do. It's, it's not just a person-centered practice, but it's to think in a person-centered manner. Um, and so when we do that, that means that we're looking at things through a trust model. And when in person-centered practices, when we say that we want to work in a trust model, that means that we're going to listen with the intent to hear. We're gonna act on what we hear, not what we think we hear or what we want to hear, but what we actually hear. And then we're gonna be honest about what we can and cannot do. Because sometimes what we hear the person wanting or asking or, or the action is something that we cannot do. And we need to be honest about that instead of pretending that maybe we can meet everybody's needs. Now you all working for the state have been looking a lot at trauma, yeah? And I hear from Cheryl that you've done a lot of work on, on setting up your clinics with a trauma-informed lens. So let's take a look at that lens. It, it comes from changing our, our focus from what's wrong with the child or the parent to reframe it and to consider what happened, what is happening, what's this child experiencing, what are the parents experiencing as they come here with that child. All of that is also a part of a person-centered practice, right? So they, they kind of go together. Person-centered practice is a trauma-informed um, practice. They, they, they go hand in hand. So we want to kind of keep that in mind. And with that, let's relook at this feeding relationship. Um, put in the chat something that you think might have to change to this basic feeding relationship to be a little more person-centered, trauma-informed for families who have children with disabilities. No answers? Am I still with you? Are you still there? <laughs> yes, we're still here, Jen. <laughs> it's very quiet. I'm not used to quiet. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, here's, here's my answer. From my point of view, as someone who's lived this for 31 years, 
I say that the only real difference is that parents of children with disabilities have all those people in the purple to deal with instead of just themselves and the kid and figuring out how to be a parent. They have to deal with the nurse, the social worker, the dietitian, the early intervention teacher, the babysitter, the respite worker, the speech pathologist, the occupational therapist, physical therapist, behavior consultant, grandmother, aunt, neighbor, the lady at the grocery store, and if they're really lucky, a personal support worker. So all of those people come into play and did you know that they are all experts? I bet you knew that, right? They're experts on everything. And even the thing of feeding your child becomes up for grabs for everybody when they want to help you with your child. So we, as the support, are responsible for what, where, when, and how food's presented within the parameters of the family's values, as long as it doesn't do harm to the child. And I add that part, as long as it does not do harm to the child, because there's so many alternative therapies out there that do harm. Um, and so we want to make sure that when harm is being done or potential harm is being done, that we as dietitians are clear in sharing that and being clear about the facts of what it is that the harm is. Um, in the Dance Center community, there was an amazing bit with, with vitamins. And when it first came out, it wasn't just vitamins. It was also a nootropic called paracetam. And then the person who was putting that together also was, was promoting Prozac for constipation. Um, so as you can see, there are some questions there about what the harm could be to the very young children. Um, even going to the extent of telling pregnant parents who were getting a, a prenatal diagnosis that they were neglectful, that they could be prosecuted for neglect for not providing these vitamins. So we wanna be in there. But we also want to keep in mind all the amazing things of mealtime. And I know I'm talking to dietitians, so I don't have to go too far to say how amazing mealtime is. And that family meal does so much for all of us. This comes from Marsha Dunn Klein and Suzanne Morris Evans. Um, and it's really just all the things that are happening at mealtime. You have your communication skills, your sensory skills. They're learning all sorts of things that no one knew they were learning. And then physical skills. And for kids with disabilities, these can get out of whack and moved around with the smallest of things. For instance, if you have a, a child who has low muscle tone, you're putting him in a high chair and you forget to provide that stabilizer of a couple of towels on either side so that they're sitting up so they can focus on how to use their arms to get the food to their mouth. Feeding becomes this really hard thing. What do they focus on? Do I focus on sitting in this chair when my body's wobbling all around? Do I focus on the food and sort of slide out of the chair? What do I do with all of this? Um, they're, they're learning from us how we feel about foods. You guys all know this stuff. Um, and it just becomes super important for everyone to think about. So in our, in our roles, this is how I break apart the feeding relationship. It has all of these different pieces. Communication, what's eaten, when it's eaten, where it's eaten, how much is available, how it's presented, and setting them up for success. Those are the responsibilities of the adult. So when I get challenged with, well, I'm not just gonna see whether or not they eat it and then provide chocolate or whatever the quick answer is to the division of responsibility, so you know it's a really big job. And we need to kind of break this down. So when I work with, with families, what I do is I start breaking it all down. So communication begins right away. You all know that. Um, it's, it's the breastfeeding, it's, it's bottle feeding, it's all of that. We don't want to be distracted. We want to hone in on this child and start to learn their cues. That's true if they have a disability as well. Another part of it, you'll see communication change to commuting, communicating family values. And I do have one story. Now keep in mind, my kids are in the 30s and, and, and Oregon's reputation has changed over the years. Um, but when my kids were little, everybody thought people from Oregon were like Mother Earth and we all wore hemp and had our hair in you know, braids and long and, and we were all very natural. It was pretty funny when I would tell this story because we had a family, a friend who was um, vegan and for their child with Down syndrome, they chose to have um, go lacto ovo for a while to get some more protein in there. They just were concerned and food choices were kind of an issue. And this, we, this was back in the day when early intervention actually came to your home and did home visits. 
and the speech pathologist came to the home and um, she showed up with a piece of beef jerky to work on chewing skills. And, and they had their hour, hour and a half long session and, and then she left and my friend gets on the phone and she's just yelling and screaming and yelling and screaming about how could this woman do this? It was so insulting, da 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 da. And I said, well, did you remind her that you're vegans? And she said, well, no. And I said, well, you need to share that with people and remind them kindly so that they remember the next time because we can't always remember. Um, so it's something where we, we as professionals need to ask and be mindful, but at the same time, we're human and families need to share back with us. So it's a, it's a good learning moment when you're receiving services to remember that your job as a recipient is to communicate just as much as it is our job as service providers to communicate with those we're working with. So when it's eaten, I am actually not going to tell you when it's eaten because I think you know the answer. How often should children be eating? You get to chat with me. You can either talk or chat. Often. <laughs> Two to three hours. Right, it's, it's when they're hungry, very good. That's a response to a responsive feeding approach. Very good, as often as they need, another good answer. So, you know, there's not like one answer, but I, I usually go through with families that question because um, instead of getting every two to three hours for the little ones, I get five hours, three to five hours. Sometimes I get these answers, um, but what is forgotten and that what you can help with as a WIC dietitian when, when the world goes back to what we can, used to consider normal, when kids get back on a school bus, the kids who are receiving early intervention services who are in your program may have a very long bus ride. So they may be getting up at, say, 5 30, 6 o'clock, so that they can go through their dressing routine, so that they can go through their eating routine. And don't be surprised if eating comes before dressing because eating's a messy affair. And then they get on the bus for like 45 minutes and they head off to school. And when you start adding up the time, they really do need to kind of eat right when they get there because it's been a long time and they've done a lot of work. Um, it's not as much an issue in preschool um, and in early intervention groups uh, as it is when they head to school. So helping families learn to, to calculate that together and recognize, oh, my child needs a snack when they get there. Do I need to send one? Do you have one? How can, how can we make that happen? So they don't have a meltdown because we all know that if you don't eat, you get really hangry and hangry and a kid who has some communication delays can be a pretty big event um, for everyone around them. So that's the when it's eaten, but we're gonna look a little bit more at what is eaten because that's where we all kind of start thinking about it. So we talk about in the what is eaten, these things that are involved the texture progression, the sensory related to challenges, and how to introduce new foods. These all take on their own life um, in, in the world of developmental disabilities. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to promote the process from applesauce to a crunchy apple. And that sounds, you know, normal, super easy, right? But it's more challenging when you have to deal with low muscle tone, um, when you have to deal with maybe some coordination issues like apraxia or, or chewing issues because of dentition, or when you have to deal with sensory processing issues. So let's take a little bit of a look at these things. This is a chart that I put together um, quite a long time ago uh, that is, has no age on it. I used to get really frustrated because everything had an age. And when you have a child with a developmental disability, you don't really follow the ages. So what I did was I took a good look at what kinds of food are offered and what kind of feeding skills we need to have and all these different things. Um, my, my, that, and so across the top is the food and down the side are our chewing stages and developmental feeding skills to note, foods to offer, and my very favorite indications for next step so that people could see what needed to happen. And I will share with you, this is when it's always 
kind of fun to focus on Down syndrome because they're known for chewing with their mouth open and I can see what's going on in there without even trying. Um, and that makes it a lot easier. What I find for most of the folks I work with where low muscle tone is an issue, whether it's Down syndrome or another developmental disability, and actually there doesn't always have to be low muscle tone as an issue. Um, I find most adults with developmental disabilities are stuck here at the ground chopped foods area, but we're, we're, we're doing things like taking a steak and chopping it into the, um, you'll see it on a person's individualized service plan, chop it into dime sized pieces or, you know, do it in a way that they can have that food with, and eat it without really chewing it. Um, so we get kind of stuck there. And, and really it's our job in these early stages to do the best that we can to get them as close as we can to those table foods and those crunchy foods. Um, so the use of hard munchables, that's something that you could do in WIC um, and make sure that you're defining what a hard munchable is for folks. It's, it's the spoon, it's, it's the, the chewing toys, the things that, that aren't really gonna go anywhere, um, that they're not gonna swallow. And then the meltable hard solids is the next phase to that and make sure that they understand what that is, that a carrot is not a meltable hard solid. You can use a carrot in, in hard munchables if you swipe those carrots out of their mouth after they chew a piece off. Um, but you can't use those if you're using it as a meltable hard solid. You don't walk away from that carrot, for instance. Um, we're trying to get to the place where they're moving their tongue around to follow their foods um, and that their chewing is, is up and down. We want to try and get it to where it can move around. But most importantly, we're trying to get that tongue to move around so they can manipulate the food. Um, the reason that I bring this up with families and, and hone in on it so much is someone type in there for me. Um, what do most soft foods have in common? Cheryl knows the answer, so she can't tell you. They're cooked. <laughs> you don't have to work very hard to chew and swallow, right? Bland? Well, not necessarily. You can have a pretty spicy French fry. And then there's those spicy Cheetos, you know. Um, so those, those soft foods are those things that we know that they can munch without ever, ever chewing. And if I had you in person, I'd have you do some chewing things because that's really fun. <coughs> Excuse me. But what most foods have in common from a dietitian's point of view is their high calorie, low nutrition. All right. So they, they, they serve the purpose of filling us up and making us feel satisfied with as little work as possible. So the person, Monica, who put in that you don't have to work very hard to chew and swallow, absolutely. But there are also usually things like ice cream and French fries and, and things that have lots of calories and they make us feel full. So then we're done with that unpleasant experience as fast as possible. What do fresh fruits and vegetables have in common? Those crunchy foods. Very, very quick, very good. High, high nutrition, low calories. So as we get older and we start looking at calories, you know, being able to handle those crunchy foods is super important. So in a hard skin, they do often have that in common as well. So they, they present a lot of different sensory challenges and some skill challenges, but that's why it's important that we don't forget to try to get to that spot. And, and at the young ages where we can manipulate food a little bit more easily and age appropriately, that's, that's a really good time to start trying to push people forward in their food textures and, and help them have those experiences um, and in their sensory experiences as well. Usually when I get to this point, that's when I hear, but my kid won't eat anything and they're super picky. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, it's a real concern. I, I can't say that I haven't experienced it, and I'm sure all of you have as well. Picky eaters are um, out there, and they're part of life, and sometimes they're not really picky. So really, what do we do? So the first thing I tell people is that, you know what? We need to make sure that in everything we're doing, we accept our children's no, and that includes children with disabilities. 
Um, oftentimes, part of the bias and culture that is um, surrounding work with people with disabilities is that they should just accept what's happening, that they should be compliant. So school is a very compliance oriented place. Um, and, and even a lot of service programs are very compliance oriented. But if you're able to say no, you know, I, I mean, compliance means you don't get to say no. And if you get to say no and people hear your no, what that builds is your self-confidence. I'm important. I can say no. We often are sorry we taught no to people. Think of your two-year-old. I hope you're laughing. Um, so it's not always what we want, but it also promotes control over their lifestyle so that they can say, no, I don't want to eat that um, or no, I don't want to do that. Um, and, and it's a safety mechanism. My best friend is a sexuality educator for people with developmental disabilities and their families. And no is something that our kids need to be able to say, not just when they're feeling panicked. They need to be able to say it early um, and it needs to be respected. Now, no doesn't mean when it comes to food that we don't come back around and try again, but we have some tricks on how we do that. So if we have somebody who's not eating much and, and we're not quite sure why, we have to do some detective work because it could be a medical thing, it could be that they don't have a good swallow or they can't chew it or who knows. It, so there could be some medical things, but oftentimes it's a behavior thing. And behavior always is communicating. So if there's something that you can focus in on, it's, it's if you can take a video of a situation and then watch it later when you're not in the middle of it, you can usually see exactly what the person is communicating. You've a little bit of the whole situation and it's amazing what they can communicate. But there are two things that, that can overcome the urge to eat. And what are they from, what do you think they might be? Intuitive eating, fear, fatigue. So if somebody's really hungry, emotion, mindful eating. Um, so we're get, what we're focusing in on, I just want to, the mindful eatings and the intuitive eating, those are good answers, but that's assuming that the, the division of responsibility is working and that we've got a trust relationship built. Um, distraction and pressure, those are all good answers, but it's not what I'm looking for. So the two things that can truly overcome the urge to eat in someone where they're only eating, say, three or four different kinds of foods are pain and breathing. So if, if we do all these other things, or if we, we do a medical assessment and we find out that there's pain or that eating blocks their airway, that's gonna be a good answer and that has to be fixed before, before they can begin to have intuitive eating or emotion. So those things can, can overcome them for kids. And when we're doing a, trying to, to develop that trust relationship, those are the two things that can get in the way. So let's talk a little bit about the sensory stages of foods and food acceptance. I want you all to think about something that you don't like. Is there a food that you really hate? What's a food that you really hate? Toss that into the, into the chat. Onions, parsnips, broccoli, lamb, interesting, liver, oh, I'm with you. Raw fish, with you there too. Mayo, interesting. Canned mushrooms, uh, that's fair, canned mushrooms, they're kind of slimy. Coconut. So we all have something, and, and if you can't tell by the slide, mine once was a Brussels sprout, okay? I just used, my mom used to cook them in a way that the house just stunk and ugh, oof, and, and I still can't handle um, stuffed green peppers. Um, but Brussels sprouts used to be my thing, so that's what the slide has, is a Brussels sprout. And, and, you know, the deal is, is that you have to be able to accept the presence of the food. That's the first step. Well, I can always do that, but I did have one person that I worked with when they brought out in most foods, if, they could, if you could smell it and it was cooked at all, that the child would, as soon as she knew that food was happening, she'd run out the door, go down to the basement, hide in a corner. She's had some real trauma around food and it, 
it had to do with with a choking episode and and all sorts of things so we had some things to work through but she couldn't handle the presence of food and then after you accept that the food exists so brussels sprouts can be in the world then i had to be able to accept the smell of brussels sprouts well okay i can do that if they're not cooked but once they got cooked and 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 read in there overcooked then you've got that really awful sort of cabbage smell um, that, that I just couldn't handle. Um, so accepting the smell of the food comes next. So we kind of have to work through that piece of it. And then our kids, they, they get to explore the food, every kid, they get to explore the food. Um, and that's when they're smearing it all over, dropping it to see if it bounces, seeing what they can do with it, if maybe it makes a pretty color in their hair, um, all those different things. As we get older, we still do this you can't tell me that if you went to i saw two livers on the list so you can't tell me if you went to the to a restaurant and somebody served you this lovely liver that you wouldn't be trying to figure out how to get that piece of kale that's on there for decoration to cover up that liver we just get sneaky about it as we get older right so we don't want that food so we kind of hide it underneath things or you know we move it around and make it look like we tried it um so there are, are things that we do to explore the property or somebody serves you something in the restaurant or even at home, you know, be it Thanksgiving and they serve you something and you aren't quite sure what it is. And don't you kind of take your fork and move it around, see what it does and see if you can smell it and yeah, I'm not sure about that. And watch other people's faces. So you're exploring the properties of that food. And then the person tastes the food and this doesn't mean that they chewed it and swallowed it. It means it went on their tongue, you know, or maybe in their mouth. Um, and this is where we always want to make sure that there's a way to get rid of it if it causes alarm. But, you know, we all know we go somewhere, we stick it in our napkin. I had, my niece had a sensory issue for a long while. And there was this one Thanksgiving, I'll never forget, where I'm worried about making sure Andy's not making too much of a mess and that he's handling his moment. He's quite a, a sensory eater. And my niece is sitting across the table from us, and I think she was nine or 10, and she ate something that she didn't like and her mouth just came open and it all came flying out onto her plate. She wasn't throwing it up, she was just spitting it out. So and I kind of looked at my brother and said, she needs to be learned. She needs to be taught how to use her napkin. <laughs> but those are the kinds of things that kids will do. They're very honest in their reactions. So we might taste it a few times before we're brave enough to actually swallow it. And that's what, that's what qualifies as eating a food. Now you all have heard that, that it takes 10 or so exposures to, to eat a new food, right? Um, I have this theory that if you have a child with, with Down syndrome, that it takes about 100 um, exposures. And if you have a child with autism, it's more like 100,000. Um, and then if you have a child who has both Down syndrome and autism, it's more like a million. And I say that definitely tongue in cheek, um, but, but it's true if you start looking at it. Um, folks with Down syndrome have a higher rate of sensory just issues related to food. And then folks with autism might have a little bit more. That's a common um, thing that we might see. And then if you have Down syndrome and autism, you put the two together, you get a whole bunch. So that's sort of, um, the way we look at things. So we go through this, this process takes longer. We may spend a long time at the middle step um, exploring the food. And that's that was the beauty of what Cheryl and I used to do together. We I used to go upstairs and talk with the families of kids with Down syndrome about just basic nutrition and metabolism and reflex and all that stuff. And, and she would be downstairs playing with food and it was always the one that came in the really picture perfect outfit after we told them to bring food clothes they didn't care about because they were going to be messy and they'd say oh she hates food she won't get she, it won't be a problem and that was always the dirtiest child just food everywhere by the end of everything um, because they had explored all of the processes uh, yeah not by yourself but with the kids um and and a couple of times we were able to videotape it and share with the parents the experiences and, and the looks on the, the parents' face when they would see their child who, who never eats anything, 
having a great time smearing stuff all over and then eating it was really amazing. And so it's a lot of a testimony to that whole explore the food, smell the food, understand that food before you're gonna to commit to putting that in your body. Um, so I spend a lot of time talking with, with families and I only have pictures of adults because Cheryl always got the kids. Um, but I always spend time with, with groups do, talking to them about taste testing and saying, don't make it this big deal. It's a taste test. So start being a food explorer. Let's have a moment. Let's make it a big activity. Let's go to the store and get some stuff and start to taste it and see what happens. Um, anytime you do taste testing where, or, or tasting where they're trying something new, whether it's at mealtime or any other time, it has to be in a safe environment. It has to be okay not to eat something. So I always have rules. You know, I say things like you don't get to comment on what people try or what they don't try um, when I'm working with the adults. And you can see in this one right here, this, everybody has a spit cup. Um, so that if, if they get freaked out, they can just get rid of it. It goes in the spit cup, but the rule is they don't get to make noise and they don't get to make a fuss about it. It just goes in the spit cup. And, and one of the guys, his mom really wanted him to learn to like lettuce. And I just happened to plan a, an activity where we were tasting all different kinds of lettuce from iceberg lettuce to a mustard green. And he was super brave. He tried absolutely everything, um, but it all ended up in the spit cup. And I asked him about it and I said, so what's that about? You know, what, it's okay, I don't have an issue, but I, I wanna know you're so brave, you tasted everything. So, so what are you feeling? And he said, well, I'm scared of, of leafy things because he had been laughing at school while eating a tossed salad and he choked on a piece of lettuce. So again, we're looking at that breathing issue and the trauma that happened and having to come around from that and say, oh, all right. So I talked to his mom and she agreed to lay off on the, the pressure for a salad. Um, but those are some things that we do and they have a great time doing that, you know, and they rate the foods and they talk about them. We talk about the different sensory things around it. Is it hot or cold? And, you, you know, you can do this with kids of all sorts of ages. You just have to make it a developmentally appropriate activity. But how does it taste and teach them about bitter, sour, spicy, sweet, salty? Um, kids with disabilities need to know this, too, and they, they sure enjoy that opportunity. Um, you might have to create a more visual activity with things that they can touch or color on so that they can do that. Now, parents are still focused on the picky eating part, which is fair. So we, we're starting to explore, is it a sensory thing? What is it? And so then based on um, some of the work of Kay Toomey, I started asking the question, make a list of all of the foods that your child eats. And here's the definition of a food. The definition of a food is, is one thing, like it's not just a, she eats potatoes as a group. A potato chip is a food. A baked potato is a food. A diced oven baked potato is a food. Um, uh, how sorry, scalloped potatoes is a food. Mashed potatoes is a food. You get the idea. And so they had to make a list. And if it was less than 50, then, then they needed to be concerned and we needed to do some work. And if it was less than 25, then we had a big crisis on our hands. Um, so what we do with this worksheet is we do, we call it the food alike worksheet. It's based on that food chaining type of theory. And what we do with this is we say, okay, so what's a food that your child eats? French fries. So if I think about the food and how it's prepared, the temperature, the color, and the texture, what's something that I could do where I'm changing as little as possible and, and making it different? What's a different food that I could make from a French fry that is almost like a French fry? Type it in the chat. Baked cauliflower. So that would be white and it would be warm and it would be soft. So really the big change would be in the shape, eh? A tater tot, um, close, yeah, that would be close. Sweet potato fries, yeah. I mean, I got dietitians in the room. I expect all sorts of answers. Any more? 
Okay, so I have a couple. So one is oven baked parsnips. Sorry to the person who hates parsnips. I saw that. Oh, fried tofu. Yeah, you could do that. Um, so oven baked parsnips are usually a big hit. Um, I cut them like a French fry. They're a little bit sweeter. Um, and we talk about how they're an anemic um, carrot and they, they kind of like that. Um, but they, they uh, taste a little bit sweeter. They have a similar texture and they have more vitamins than and fiber than um, a french fry so it's like a great idea roasted zucchini strips yum but they kind of fall apart at least mine do i can't like pick them up they get all wet and soggy um, and the other one i do with parents is oven sweet baked sweet potatoes i am probably going to start writing down all of these ideas these are all very good um what, what could you do for spaghetti noodles another another kid favorite Ooh, yucca yum okay So we've moved on to spaghetti noodles. There's some really simple ones. Spaghetti squash, right? Zucchini noodles, right? You guys did it great. You're really fast. Some of the others are, are um, you could do other things, cut his noodles and those, those nice little stripper things, make all sorts of vegetable noodles. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of those, those noodles, those white noodles that come in watery package at the store. I've forgotten what they are. Not udon noodles, but they're like that. Maybe shirataki, rice noodles, yakisoba, they're like that, but you could do all of those things. And cha you know, sometimes the point isn't so much to change lots of, uh, get into lots of, um, they're gluten-free noodles, just so you know. <laughs> but just so they're not, um, they don't, we don't always focus on the nutrition component as much as we are just that it's different. And that's the other part about this worksheet that I like is that I can say not so much about the nutrition, but let's just think about changing the food because we're dealing with a sensory issue here. We have to start being able to introduce some things. And then um, I have this little thing I do called a tasting journal. And, and I, I have it set up so that they can either circle the, I liked it, it was okay, or I hated it. Um, icon or they can write about it. Um, as they get older, lots of folks with disabilities love to journal. So that's part of, of what I try to set up is journaling. Um, I just read an article though where they were saying a tasting journal was, was like a traumatic thing and that you shouldn't do that. So I think some of it is to look at it why you're doing it. So in, in my view, the tasting journal and, and doing a tasting activity and keeping track of what they're doing is to say how brave they were and what they did. And look at these are all the foods I like. So when someone asks me, what do I like to eat? I could say, I like these things. And as they get older and they're, they're wanting to move into their own apartment, it becomes a tool to say, I can make menus from these things. These are the things that I like. And that's where they can start with some menu planning. Okay, so that's a quick on what, what is eaten. Where it's eaten becomes another thing that some people might need some, some uh, coaching on. And, and I usually, I talk about some of the basic ones, limiting eating to specific areas. The reason we do that is so that people know where eating's okay and it keeps your house cleaner, which is a byproduct of a nice thing. Um, but as they get older, if they're snacking or sneaking food, then they, you know, it's just another boundary that's already set in place so that they can use that in the rules. Um, how does noise affect the child in the environment? Um, part of, part of when you're dealing with sensory issues, if you have a person who has, a, um, who's experiencing some texture challenges, then you're also going to look at the noise in the environment. Um, and Cheryl was telling me that you guys are doing Zoom, um, meetings these days. And it, it could be to a, your benefit if, if you could set it up so that maybe you just watch a meal time if they're open for it or feeding time, or even just ask them if they're game to, I don't know about the implications legally, but if they're game to record themselves and send it to you. Um, but if you can look at a, a meal time, you might be able to see some sensory clues that will tell you why mealtime isn't going very well. I had one family who had, I've forgotten how many kids she had, it was like five kids and, and her child with Down syndrome was, let's say three-ish. And then she had middle schoolers and upper elementary school. So there was a big age gap. And, the, and they, there were a number of boys and the boys would come in all loud and bouncing their basketballs and doing all these things. 
and and the the child with Down syndrome was so overwhelmed by the what was going on around him that he couldn't focus on how to eat. Um, he the sensory input was just too much. He was completely overstimulated um, and couldn't deal with that. And it wasn't it wasn't even that he was trying to connect with brother or sister. It was that it was that there was just so much coming in and, and really just moments after you know, they would try to do meal time and they're just their normal chaos going on. You add that one more um, request of him to, to learn something, to do something new, and he would just totally melt down. So when we set in place some rules about how to, for the older kids, about how to come through the room, how to um, communicate, not to bounce the balls, you know, some things like that, they saw some big changes. And that was, that was enough of a, um, reward for the older kids as it was for the child who wanted to eat more because they realized that they had their actions mattered to their brother or sister who they were still kind of trying to figure out how to engage with. So that was a nice thing. Um, sometimes it can be just the big room. Um, if they're eating in a big room or in a restaurant with lots of sound, that can be an issue. The lighting can be an issue. So taking a look at all of those different things. Um, some accommodations to consider for kids. Um, kids with low muscle tone, uh, I'm convinced that if we're, we're using a responsive environment that they, they begin to learn that they are at risk for falling or for being pushed over or you know that they're they're not as stable as they would want to be they might need more personal space kids with um, sensory issues might need more personal space so you want to consider that when you're looking at meal time do they need a little more space just to feel safe um, and then there's the whole issue of joining versus versus being joined I'm sure that there's a much more technical way of describing that, but those are my words. Um, what I know is that, for instance, my son can't walk into a crowded room. So he couldn't walk into, we got accommodations on his IEP and they were thinking it was because of the time that it takes him to get there, to wash his hands, to do all the things, to get his food and sit down and get settled. But that wasn't why he needed to go early. I mean, it's all, you know, it's true that all that took longer, but he eats pretty fast. Um, but the reason he needed to go early was because he can't walk into a room that's full of noise and action and people. Um, so he would, he would get to the door, see all the activity, turn around and run. Um, but if we put him in there, he can be there with all of it coming in. And I call this the being joined part. He can be there with all of the stuff slowly coming in and it can rise to the same level of activity and crowdedness and people and movement, and he's just fine. Um, and then after he was older and I started working with other families, I found that this was true of a lot of people with sensory um, challenges, was that, was that it, it's easier to have it come to you slowly and have it change slowly than it is to have to walk into the brick wall of noise and sound and movement. So that's something to keep in mind. And as I talked about this with Cheryl, we, we started talking about, well, how can we apply this to, to your clinic? So how could you apply that to your clinic? Do you have some thoughts about that? You can either open your mic and talk to me or type it in the chat. And this is when I miss being in the room with you. Be aware of lights and sounds, yeah. You might want to look at um, if somebody's playing with a really loud toy, if, if that seems to be affecting the child or the mom. Have the appointment first thing in the morning because they're getting there first before all the other people are getting there, or maybe right after lunch. Um, is it, it's a is it slower later in the day? Then that would be good too. Yeah. So thinking about those things, if you know that this is a child that has some sensory challenges that you can um, perhaps accommodate. I know that um, 
when we have been challenged, there's, there's certain times in, in, you know, you go up and down the scale of when you're going to have challenges and when you're not. Um, and we went to OHSU at, to see a developmental pediatrician friend. And he was so kind that he came out, we couldn't get him to go down the hallway to the exam room. And he was kind enough to come out to the waiting room where we were very comfortable and there was nobody around. We made sure that, I actually think we moved to a different corner where there wasn't really anybody around. And we went through our visit, um, the talking part of our visit out there in the waiting room. And then he got to know Andy and Andy got to know him. And then we went back, to, he, was, he was willing to go with, with him after that back to the um, waiting room. And yeah, asking an adult what's needed is, is often a really good thing. Um, sometimes we know and sometimes we don't. Um, that's, that's the challenge to that one. Sometimes we know what to do and sometimes we don't. For state staff, it would be great to be able to put notes in these accommodations and preferences into the new data system where somewhere on the screen where we would schedule from. Yeah, that would be good. Um, that would be a really good thing to be able to keep notes about it so that you can share with each other about what worked. Um, I would encourage you to spend time on what worked and not what doesn't work unless it's a really big doesn't work um, because things can change. Just keep that in mind. Um, one technique that, that isn't really a part of this, but, but I'll just toss it out there is, is you, you can call it either I, I hesitate to call it a social story with um, professionals because if you look it up, a social story actually tells people how to behave when they get there and that's not what this is about. But it could be considered a pre-teaching story if you need to have a name for it. Um, photo stories that are from the kid's perspective are really, really helpful. Um, and especially when you come to a WIC clinic, you're gonna have to have your finger pricked um, that can be a really helpful thing for people who experience sensory challenges uh, to be able to see what's going to happen from their perspective when they get there. So that means that you have to take the pictures from a three foot level, um, you know, so get down on their level to see what things look like um, and head towards each spot that the child's going to have to go to to say, this is where we're going to meet this person. And, um, go through the different steps and, and I'd be happy to um, send some resources around that kind of thing um, if you'd like. But that can help a lot with the anxiety that comes with that. Seating scenarios, we actually have already kind of talked about it. This is the very, this first picture is the very um, physical component of it in that we want to make sure we're supporting people's bodies. When you look at um, when you look at, the, this is my son Andy, and when you look at him sitting at our first kitchen table with no booster seat, um, he's got his legs pulled up because he obviously can't touch the ground. And what does that do to his body mechanics there? Um, I won't wait for you to type it in. You get, whenever you put, just sit in your chair and pull your feet up crisscross applesauce style. And, and what does it do to the upper part of your body? You lean forward. So he's leaning forward, and once you start to lean forward, it's really hard to figure out how to work that spoon, you know, I mean, just shove it in your mouth. And at a certain point, you know, I think some kids ask the question, why am I even using this spoon? I'll just stick my face in this bowl, um, which actually, I can't blame them. Um, but that's something to think about. So some things that you can do is you can come up with a, a box underneath. And let me show you this other table that we were talking about earlier. This is, this is a common table in school settings and preschool settings, you know, sort of the picnic bench kind of thing. A really easy thing to do is to create a box that is the height that the child needs so that their feet are supported so that they can manage their upper body so that they can then manage their arms so that they can then manage to eat safely and appropriately. Um, it sounds really simple, but it's, it's not because you, know, you get the box under there and sometimes they kick the box away. So you gotta have some helpers to make sure the box stays in its place. Um, and then the other inevitable thing that happens is that um, other students want a box too, um, which was how we then ended up with a lunch bunch. And that became a whole nother sort of informal uh, study that we did on, on the effects of having your own bunch of kids that you sit and eat with. 
Um, but making sure, you know, all the kids there, so many of the things that I'm going to bring up that are, that are almost essential for folks who have developmental disabilities and low muscle tone are, are things that all of the students could benefit from. Um, so keep that in mind. These are not rocket science. They're sort of um, common sense in many ways. And I can't tell you how much I, I miss seeing you all because I, I don't know if you're getting my jokes or not. <laughs> so next up is how it's presented. Um, and I, I really drive back to that division of responsibility with how it's presented because it's all about choice. Um, even at, you know, two and, and one or whatever, we, we, we want to offer those choices. And you hear parents out there, they're so much better than I was when I was young. And they're saying, well, we can have this or this. And they have these two perfectly good choices. And, and the child chooses, oh, I want this. And it looks so nice. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we're doing that with balance in mind. One thing that we could do to support that is when they're at the table, we can create ways to communicate and, and even not at the table. Folks who have kids with Down syndrome all start out with sign language. So if you have some, some kids coming through who have Down syndrome, it's, a, it's good for you to learn these three signs. More, which is putting your fingers together. Um, as I hope you can tell that in the picture. And then all done and no way. Those are all three things that you want to want to be able to say. Um, most of us who have kids with Down syndrome are really sorry we taught them more um, pretty early on. This this also shows um, a, a PEX sort of way of saying I want more drink. I'm all done. I want more food um, for somebody to to respond that way. But having your communication um, tools available to you is is a part of how you make those choices throughout. Um, displaying the menu choices, I often find that lots of behavior gets better when we start to put the menu choices out for everybody to see. That takes a lot of work on mom and dad's part. Um, as they get older, they can start to do it. It just depends on, on how, what it is you're trying to deal with. One of the things this helps with is, is oftentimes adults interpret a person's constantly asking about the next meal as being over focused on food when what they're really doing is marking time what comes next is breakfast um, or what comes next is lunch so that they can see what's coming i'm getting my time check food can be a literacy activity we use match select name to learn about food it's a great way to help them with their reading skills i'm going to skip that this is a, a tool that I use. I love the refrigerator. It's a tool where you put a, a magnet on it and you have labels or you can have pictures or whatever so that the child can choose the snack that they want at the communication center. Um, just be careful you don't do what this one is. It's all one sheet. It's not cut apart. Because if you have that and you don't have any popcorn, you're going to be very sorry. So you want to make sure you're offering what's available. We'll just skip that. Um, and then let's just get to this last little bit, which is where the, the division of responsibility really comes in. Um, when the division of responsibility or the feeding relationship goes awry, what I find more often than not is I find people who are very controlling and they, I, they're part of the food police. So they keep track of everything. I, I have even watched at a national conference a mother chase after her adult child and rip the cookie out of the lunch box that was provided by the conference because she didn't want him to have the cookie. He didn't have a medical reason not to have it. She just didn't want him to have the cookie. Um, and that was embarrassing to him, but that was the, the level of control that she felt she needed to have. So we want to think about that and come back to that food responsibility that or division of responsibility um, and think about how can we support people in these young years to to honor and believe in that feeding relationship. It does work for children who have developmental disabilities and autism. We just have to look at how we're providing things and what we're providing. Um, Melissa Polfus is someone who's, whose research I've just been um, introduced to. And she, she did a whole study on uh, related to this division of responsibility and the high responsiveness and low responsiveness and how that affected feeding. Um, 
and and we usually look at things from a, a obesity standpoint but oops but she didn't do that and what she found was that was that if we are listening to understand what's going on in the family that become more responsive we might do more to affect the feeding relationship and the responsiveness of the family by doing that than we will if we we sort of stick to the feeding behavior only um, and I think that you all know that, um, but we can, we can definitely have an impact on those controlling practices if we start early and help people begin to learn about that feeding relationship. Um, and I'll just end that with saying that um, it's the one thing as a parent, I feel like I did right for both of the boys. Um, and even to this day, Andy is 31. He still just has one reliable word that he uses in a lot of different ways. Um, but he won't eat if he's not hungry. Um, he even, even well, with the exception of chocolate, but I don't see that as an exception, but he'll, he'll eat if it's chocolate. Um, I have some resources here for you. Some of them are just things I want you to know about. Um, if you see someone who has Down syndrome, and, and that includes the growth charts, there's brand new growth, growth charts for children with Down syndrome. Okay, brand new is 2011, um, but it's better than the ones that were from like 1930. Um, and then there's healthcare guidelines that are constantly updated um, and approved by the American Academy of Pediatrics for children with Down syndrome. If you have a loved one with Down syndrome in your family, we have just published healthcare guidelines for adults in the Journal of American Medical Association as of October 20th. Um, I want you to encourage you to go revisit your own lawn presentation called Courage Courageous Conversations. That was a fabulous presentation that you have on your website um, that will work. And if you're interested in working with um, in more depth with people with Down syndrome, medical professionals who work for people with Down syndrome, the medical interest group is listed there. And with that, um, really fast, I, this usually takes me three hours to go through, so it was the fastest thing I've ever done. I want to take some questions, but I also want to give you this opportunity to send in one word to describe today's session and how you felt after the end of the session. And as you do that, um, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask questions or add them to the chat, um, we can do that. Um, I, I really like discussion more than I do doing all the talking. Okay, Cheryl, you can come back and talk. I am back, um, and I wish we did have three hours with you. Um, you um, go ahead as you, I, my question was in the chat is just, um, what are the ways that we could use the, the WIC foods uh, as, as making food choices as your refrigerator chart? So remind me what the WIC foods are. Oh, that's our WIC food list, which I, um, it's, it's, so it, it's just all the foods that we offer. So um, I can send you a whole list of them, but it's anywhere from, um, you know, the, the beans, the cheese, fresh fruits and vegetables, the milk, um, jump in everybody. <laughs> so some of the things you can do that, that are really helpful, just, I'm just going to toss them out there. Um, when you're working with folks with autism, we, we want to have pictures that don't have backgrounds. And, and the way you can get that, if you don't have, you know, photo editing, so say you go to Google Photos and you get pictures of some of your WIC foods, but they have these backgrounds or whatever, you can put them into your PowerPoint presentation and there's a thing that says remove background. And you can do that and screen capture that and you'll have a background free picture of your item. What are some ideas that you all have? I'm liking all your words. Don't you like the word cloud? It's fun. <laughs> there was um, a lot of enthusiasm of the um, social, the photo social story. Um, and I know when we, you and I had talked, we were talking about even that doing a videotape at the yes. kids level of what a clinic visit is like. So there's a thing called video, it's called video self-modeling, um, but you can change that into a, pre, a social story or a pre-social 
pre-teaching story. The key to that is to make sure that you're doing it from their perspective. Um, and, and Cheryl and I talked a lot about that. It's, it's really, I, I will send you, Cheryl, I will send you a copy of a, a really bare bones photo social story we used with Andy so that you've got that because I can get everybody's permission for the Andy one. Um, when he transitioned to a new school um, and how we took pictures of what he would walk the hallway we would walk down. We read that thing maybe 20 times before we went to the school and we got to the school and before school started and we walked down the halls and he started to realize, oh, that is that. Oh, that is that, you know, matched it to his book. And the next thing you knew, he was just waltzing down and doing the whole thing on his own. It's a very powerful thing. Any other questions, comments? I liked thinking about the need for some transition time. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's something to build in as, as much as possible. So I appreciated that thought um, beyond just sensory considerations. Yeah. Um, and, and there's, you know, the processing time for folks um, with developmental disabilities, and, and sometimes your parents are going to people going to be people who were maybe not identified as having a disability or have a learning disability, and this would be the same concept. The processing time to to do that, we, we call it executive function, to to process things. It goes in and then it jumbles around. Um, and they have to first figure out how to understand it. And then they have to figure out what their answer is to that. And then they have to process how to share that answer. So when there's communication um, disorders, that's really something to think about is how much time it takes a person to respond to your request as well, not just in the transition of, oh, I have to move on and do this next thing, but, but I have to respond to you as well. So it goes in, tosses around. And the research tells us that it takes um, sometimes a minute for all of that to go in, be processed around to formulate the, the physical response and then provide the physical response. And that can be really hard to, to do, to wait a whole minute. Well, I thank you for your, your word clouding. That was really nice. Um, I enjoyed that. Um, and I appreciate all of your time. I know that, that you're on a, on a time limit. This is my contact information. Feel free to write to me anytime. I didn't get into my CV with you because I'm not going to do that. Um, but if there's something that I can help you with, I'd be happy to have that conversation. Um, and I appreciate everything that you do. WIC has always been one of my favorites. Thank you, Jen. Do they have dietitians in early intervention? I'm reading this comment. <laughs> I don't think they have dietitians in early intervention. Honestly, they didn't have them when Andy was young, and that was when they were the most robust. Mm -hmm. Well, they used to have them in other states. Ah. I used to be one. I wrote the comment. It's in oh. Oregon that I, specifically that I'm saying this. Is I, I, they've never had it, but in Hawaii they did, and they had it in other states as well. Wow, that would be fun, wouldn't They're it? They're part of a team, yeah. That would be really fun. Yeah, we always get kind of left out. Yeah, they didn't have dietitians when, and, and, and now I'm, I'm not even sure that they're getting home visits anymore. So you all might be like a, a really big part of their lives. Yes, very much so. It, it, um, Oregon kind of made a deal with the devil um, when we went to um, capitated healthcare and um, did, opted out of the early um, periodic detection and screening program, the EBSDT. Um, and so as a result, um, we'll have kiddos who go from WIC being prevention um, to um, tertiary care to feeding clinics a lot of times. So a lot of the dietitians that are on the call bridge that gap. Um, and I know a lot of you um, are doing some home visits. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Um, I know you are not doing them right now, um, but um, the, I, I know Stephanie, you do. 
Stephanie's done them and then I've done them too as Annie. Thanks, Annie. Yeah. 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 So um, I'm just wondering if some of these, the food chain or just kind of the understanding of looking at how to um, broaden that scope of, um, of food options might be helpful with working with some of the, the families that we do. There's some, some, you know, if you're into books, there's some great books that are out there too that can help. Um, I know Cheryl knows the Extreme Picky Eating one is a good one. Food Chaining is a book that's got some really interesting ideas in it. Um, there's one called Just Take a Bite. And if you keep your, your heart to the feeding relationship, you can get some good ideas out of that book as well. Yeah. Well, and in, uh, Joan, you've I've got the, some really excellent resources, and so we'll be um, looking at those and just um, seeing what um, supports we can provide to the dietitians working in WIC. And I thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, and if folks have other questions or comments that want to come through, feel free to send them to me, and I'll make sure Joan gets them. Um, but we're right at four o'clock, and I want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, this has been recorded. Um, hopefully, I can um, work the magic to get it up on our on our website um, and um, share that if someone has missed it. But we had a great turnout today. So thank you to Joan, our speaker, and thank you to everyone, um, and have a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, everyone. All right, we'll sign off. Um, thank you. Bye-bye.